1 John chapter 4. And um, we'll keep rolling through 1 John here. If you remember, theme of 1 John, God is light, God is love, God is life. And as we've been traveling through 1 John, if you remember, we started off, um, John's clear. He's very dogmatic, which, which means he's very straight to the point. And he's, he's very, if you're a believer in Jesus and you love Jesus, you're, and, and he addresses us as his little children, okay? His little born-again ones, his little technon is the Greek word. He says, basically, if you're a believer in Jesus, you can't stay in the darkness, all right? You might fall into the darkness sometimes, but you're going to move into the light. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to, again, you're going to gravitate to the light. He says, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're still going to sin, but if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. He says, if you are a believer in Jesus and you're really in him, you're really born again, you have an anointing that comes from God. You know what the truth is. You can hear the truth. You can gravitate to, to the truth. He says, if you really love Jesus, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to love God's people, though it's not always easy. And if you see, as you go through 1 John, he kind of goes back and forth. He says the same thing a lot over and over again. He's going to talk to us about um, false spirits again, again in chapter 4, and then he's going to get back to loving one another. So I think the Holy Spirit's really trying to send us a message that if you really love Jesus and believe in Jesus, you know what the truth is and you understand whatever it is and you understand that you're supposed to love your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a recurring theme all the way over, over and over again in the book of 1 John. But we left off last time talking about if you are a believer in Jesus, you know what? You have confidence toward God that your prayers are going to be answered. To me, it's awesome knowing that I can go to God knowing that not only hears my prayers, that he's going to answer my prayers. Now, the problem is sometimes I don't like when the answer is no. Okay? I, <laughs> and it's usually, again, James tells us that the answer is usually only no when... We're lusting after something that's not in God's will. That's not God's best for us. And, and the scriptures clearly tell us we want to consume things on our own lust sometimes. And again, God, God knows what's best, best for us. He's going to say no sometimes. But he says, when our hearts are right towards God, if you read the end of, end of chapter 3, we have confidence toward God that he is going to grant and answer those prayers. Because we're his children, because we're his kids. Now, what does the scripture say? What, the, what, what does the Bible talk about? It talks about because we're his kids, because we love Jesus, that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. That means if you love Jesus, if you, if you are in Jesus Christ, you know what? All the promises of God are laid out for you, are there for you. And you know what? God wants the answers in your prayers to always be yes. Now, when you consume them on your own lust for your own selfish motives, God's going to say no. But I really believe with all my heart that God wants to do so much more. He wants to give so much more to us. He wants to do so much more in our lives. But so often, our motives and our hearts are fixed on this life and on this world. And God is, you know, God is good. If a son or a daughter came up to you and said, hey, you know, can I have this and can I have that? And you knew it was going to hurt them and you know they weren't ready to handle it, you would say no. And that's what God does sometimes. But then again, the flip side is, is true, that if our hearts do want to glorify Jesus, if we get to a place in our Christian walk where we say, Lord, you know what? I've had enough of the world. I had enough of doing things my own way. You know what? I really want you to be lifted up and glorified. You know what? You're going to see the prayers start to be answered one after the other, after the other, after the other. I said this before, since we started this church, you know, we're going into our 10th year next year. Um... There hasn't been one thing that God hasn't done that, that people have prayed for, that we've prayed for as a corporate ministry. There hasn't been one. God has done them all. And I believe God will keep doing it if our heart and our motive wants to glorify Jesus Christ. If we really love God. Now listen, he ended off chapter 3 saying, Hereby we know that he abides in us, he transitions, by the spirit which he has given us. And then chapter 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So John says this. 
He gets back to the false prophet thing. He moves back to it again. Like he started to talk about it in chapter 2, and now he brings it up again. And he says this. He goes, listen, many false prophets have gone on into the world. Don't believe every spirit. Now, now the reason why he's writing, writing this, he's literally saying, stop believing every spirit. Because there was false teaching coming into the church saying that, you know, it had some Greek thought connected to it. Well, G- Jesus, God didn't really come in the flesh. Because again, and I even said this in the last service, it went along with the last message. In the Greek mind, anything that was like of material was evil or subject to evil. And that started to infiltrate the church saying, you know what, well, God didn't really come down and take on human flesh. That really didn't happen. And, and, and they kind of differentiated between, you know, Jesus and Jesus the Christ. And what they started to come up with was, was the Spirit of God, you know what, the God part of Jesus came on Jesus at his baptism, and then it kind of left him at, uh, at the uh, crucifixion. After the crucifixion, it kind of went away. Strange. And John, and John is telling people, stop believing this stuff. God made it simple. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God is with us, that he came into the world. God really became his creation, became a man. He took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of sinful men, right? That's what Philippians 2 says. That's what God did for us, and, he, and he's given us a litmus test here. Beloved, that's us, those who love Jesus. Believe not every spirit. Try the spirits. It's, it's literally worded continually keep trying the spirits, whether they are, are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now listen. It, it, it doesn't matter just if people just name the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean they're all Christians, you know. Many people name the name of Jesus. You're really a Christian if you believe that Jesus is the, the divine Son of God. It doesn't matter if people knock on your door with suits on and tell you this and tell you that. They have their own private interpretation. They believe that Jesus is the, is the, the brother of Michael the archangel and all this weird stuff that's not found in the Bible because they try to explain and figure out the Godhead. And we can't do that. But he says, believe not every spirit. Try them. Now listen, I want to tell you a quick little story. You say, well, how do we know? How are we sure? How can we know? Well, he gives us the test here. If anybody who does believe that Jesus Christ, by the way, what does Jesus mean? It means Jehovah is salvation. That's what Jesus means. What does Christ mean? It's it's the word Messiah in the Greek, right? That Jesus, Jehovah, is the Messiah. Jehovah is salvation and he's the Messiah. That God came into this world was born of a baby, was the Messiah, went to a cross to die for our sins and rose again. That's the gospel message. That's what the Bible says. Anything less than that or more than that is not the gospel and is adding to the gospel. It's very simple. John says if people don't believe that, it's not of God. So I had some Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door one time. And I kept inviting them back out. And I know some Christians say, you know, you're not supposed to entertain them, send them off. And Well, I, I love it when they come. I tell them to come. So they come, and we do our, we're doing our Bible ping pong. Bible ping pong, I say, going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. They say, Pastor Matt, why is it so difficult? Why, why doesn't God make it so easy? Those people are zealous too. Don't they really believe? And I say, no. Do you know their, their New World Translation is a private interpretation that only they can control? Did you know that? And it's amazing to me. Did you know in the New Testament, they add the word Jehovah and they differentiate the word Jehovah with Jesus. They just put it in there. That's not in the Greek. It doesn't say Jehovah. The word is Lord. It's kurios in the Greek, which means Jesus is Lord. So they add in other spots the word Jehovah to differentiate. And I'm going back and forth and I'm telling them this stuff and teaching them this stuff and trying to show them it. And they, they're just not hearing it. So then finally I say, they, they, they give me this illustration. This is the illustration they give me. They go, well, listen, I don't need to listen to anything you have to say because if you lose your wallet, 
and, and you find your wallet, you don't have to look for your wallet again. That was his reason for not having to listen to anything else. Well, my Bible says try the spirits. See, I'm confident. Listen, I went because one, one of my brothers in Christ were battling with some of this stuff because these people are zealous. They're zealous for something that's not true. So I said, listen, I'll go right on their turf. I'll go right into their kingdom hall. I'll go down into their basement with them, and I'll Bible ping pong with them right in front of you. I said, but I'll guarantee you, because my Bible says test and try the spirits. But I'll guarantee you they won't come on to our church, though. Oh, no, no, this, they will. Yes, they, no, they will, they will. Well, you know what? I went and did that. You know, try to show them, you know, the whole Colossians message that Jesus is God and all this stuff and what firstborn really means, you know, all this stuff. I don't have time to get into it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You can ask me after if you don't. So I'm in there, and then I said, all right, now, you know, why don't you come to our church now? We'll get a couple of godly men from our church, and we'll sit down, and we'll do the same thing. No, I can't go over there. Why? Why? I said, why? Again, because if you lose your wallet and you find it again, is what they tell me. You don't have to go looking for anything else. Did you know that's what the Mormons say too, by the way? The Mormons say, the Holy Spirit told me that the Book of Mormon is true the, the, and the Pearl of a Great Price. The, the, the Holy Spirit told me. So like there's no arguing with that. So finally I said to him, I said, listen, well, if you lose your wallet and you find it again, do you open it up to see if the money's still in there? <laughs> that means poke around a little bit. That means we as Christians should be confident in what we believe about Jesus Christ. And listen, we get the things all the time. Oh, you guys are born again. You belong to a cult. It's this and that. And, you know, for me, more traditional, maybe brothers in Christ, maybe not. I don't know. But you should be confident in what you believe about Jesus Christ. You should be able to say, you, you should be able to try the spirits. Because, because listen, God made it very simple. Look what he says. Beloved, believe not every spirit, or stop believing every spirit, but try the spirits, continually try them, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. God became flesh. Jehovah is salvation, very simple. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and, it, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it, it should come, and even now already is in the world. Now listen. Some of you know I have the, I have the Revelation interpretation. That I, I, I really believe that the Islam is the beast of Revelation. Now you can argue with me on it if you want. But I, I think it's getting more and more clear. More and more clear. But what do they confess? Because they, for, for this, again, people say, well, they, we need to build bridges together. They believe in Jesus too, just a little different than we do. And I say, no, they don't. No, they don't. They, and again, they do believe in a Jesus, but it's not the biblical Jesus. They believe that there was a Jesus. Listen, he was born of a virgin. They believe that. They've, they believe he spoke some, God, so, some messages for God. They believe he did some great things and had great teachings. They don't believe he died on a cross and rose again from the dead, which is the gospel that Paul says. And listen, they believe that, that, that listen to me, they believe that this Jesus is coming again. We believe that Jesus is coming again. But listen, know what this Jesus does when he comes again. This is what they believe. Don't believe anything that I say. Go study it for yourself. They believe that when this Jesus comes again, his job is to hook up with the Muslim Mahdi, which is their Messiah, Mahdi, which is their Messiah. He hooks up with them, and they go around, and this Jesus tells all the Christians and the Jews, especially the Christians, you guys were wrong. I never said I was the son of God. And he, he leads a mass slaughter with the Mahdi to kill Christians. I believe we're seeing the beginnings of that right now. You say, you're, you're nuts, Pastor Matt. You're, you're, you're crazy. Well, if you don't believe that God came in the flesh, the Bible says that's a spirit of Antichrist. That's what it says. And that's what they teach, and that's what they believe. And listen, I don't believe in starting holy wars with, with Muslim groups. And believe me, I get nervous because I know some of this stuff goes on the radio, and there's a huge Muslim population in Boston. 
And I, you know, if they're going to come up here, they're going to hunt, hunt me down and all this stuff. I don't know if we're at that point yet, but I think about that stuff. But I also think it's coming too, by the way. I think it's coming. It, it already has started to come in this country. Now, look at Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now the context is in regards to false teaching and false prophets. That it doesn't matter what your IQ is, or how smart you are, or how, how, how much of an education you've had or hadn't had. Listen, if you have Jesus, you're an overcomer. If you have Jesus, you can recognize false doctrine. If you have Jesus, you can recognize antichrist, antichrist systems. Now listen, it's my job to remind you of this stuff. <laughs> Remember Jesus held the, held the Jewish religious leadership accountable because they missed the day of his visitation. And I believe the church as a whole, listen, in the 70s, in 80s, there was this huge thing about the rapture, second coming of Christ, and this and that. He's coming, he's coming, and you know, it, it, was, it was through the churches like Matt. Now we've like moved away from that. Now there's whole movements out there that won't even talk about the signs of the times, that won't even talk about end times. Well, that divides Christians, and we don't want to fight over those things. Well, we can divide over those things. We can debate them vigorously. We can divide, but listen, it's our job as Christians to discern the signs of the times. And I believe it's right in front of us. It's right there. It's at the door, like Jesus said. And if you really know Jesus, if you really belong to Jesus, it says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You'll recognize this stuff when it comes on the scene. And I believe it's right in front of us. They are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now he's going to transition here from false prophets and false teachers again to loving one another. Again, if you really love Jesus, if you really belong to Jesus, you can recognize false doctrine. Now the thing that makes me crazy in the body of Christ is we're too busy fighting, you know, Christians fighting Christians that we can't go out there and fight the devil and live for Jesus. We're too busy pitting this denomination against this denomination. And it's like the church at Corinth. Remember the church at Corinth? I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. And the real spiritual one said, oh, I'm of Christ. All fighting one another in the church. That's what we do as Christians. We're too busy fighting one another within Christianity that we can't do anything for Jesus. You know how many people have tried to get together and get different churches and groups and pastors together just to pray? And they say, oh, they, they believe this about this and they believe this about that. And, you know, they believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we don't. They believe they can speak in tongues and, and they don't. And, they, and it, it, they, they won't even get together to pray for one another. Because you know what the pastors are afraid of? This is what they're afraid of. Well, if they go there, they'll learn something different that I don't teach at, at our church. And maybe they'll leave my church and they'll go to that church. <laughs> what a joke. But that's what happens. Some of you have been a part of that. Some of you have been, and that's, you know what? Nothing gets done for God that way. No two Christians are going to see eye to eye on every single little area of doctrine and everything in the Bible. No, we're not. But when it comes to loving Jesus and believing the gospel, you know what? In, in preaching the gospel, we should be united on these things. Then he talks about love again, verse 7. Beloved. He addresses the church, as his kids, as beloved. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. You say, Pastor Matt, you know, talking about false doctrine and talking about differences and talking about all these things and Muslim groups, and that, that's not loving them. Well, the Bible says love rejoices in the truth that doesn't rejoice in error. So that is love. Love tells somebody the truth. Love tells somebody if, if they're going to end up in the lake of fire, you warn them. 
That's what love does. Now it says, let us, God's children, love one another. Love is of God. Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. You say, wait a minute. A lot of, a, a lot of different religions say they think that we're supposed to love people. A lot of different people say that we're supposed to love one another. So you mean everybody that loves knows God and is born of God? Well, no. Everyone that loves the way God says that we're supposed to love is born of God and knows God. What kind of love is that? And I listen, I, and I, I believe when the Bible says that, it says evil men will wax worse and worse, the love of many will grow cold. I believe that that's happening. But look what he says. Look at the kind of love he's talking about. In this was manifest that the love of God, verse 9, toward us. The love of God was showed to us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So what kind of love is of God? Love that does something. Action. God said, I love you. How much do I love you? I'm sending my son into the world for you. That's how much I love you. And you know what? And we want to judge the love of God by everything else and every other circumstance. But the Bible says, you know what? In this was shown the love of God to us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And sometimes we do things with the Lord. Sometimes we say, God, God, if you love me, God, if you love me, you know what? You know, you'll give me back my wife, God. God, if you really love me, you know what? You, you, my prodigal child will, will, will repent. God, if you really love me, God, you'll help me out of this problem with my mortgage. God, if you really love me, I'll get that promotion. God, if you really love me, we, we do those things sometimes. I do those things. And sometimes God doesn't do them. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. God, if you really love me, I'm so lonely right now. I just feel lonely. I need a spouse. I need this, I need that. And then in a year, you'll say, God, if you really love me, you'll take this person away. No, no. Seriously. But that's just, how, that's just how we get it. But the Bible says that God loved us. He did something about it. He sent his son into the world for us. That's how we judge the love of God. That's how we're supposed to judge the love of God. Now listen, I, I, I can't even imagine. You know, it's, some of you have, have you know, seen your kids go through some things. Broken legs, broken arms. And, and you would do whatever you can to stop that from happening. You have done whatever you could do from stop. No, not only broken legs, broken arms, but getting into things in life and going down the wrong path. You've done whatever you could do to stop that from happening. You've, you've moved heaven and earth as much as you could to stop those things from happening. Now, can you imagine that God sent his son into the world? The Bible says it pleased the father to bruise his own son. That God sent his son into the world. He sent them in to be handed over to sinners. He sent them into the world to be mocked and, and turned on by his own, his own people. He, not only did he send them into the world, he sat there and he watched and he stayed his hand while the whole crucifixion process was going on. And he did nothing about it and he couldn't do anything. So much to the point where Jesus said, have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Herein is love. That's love. That's love. Now listen, the Bible says that's the kind of love we're supposed to have for one another. Love that does something about something. Love that takes action. Look what he says. Love that sacrifices. Verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God. Not that we love God. So many people walk around and say, I love God. I love Jesus. I love God. I love Jesus. Do you really? but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the atoning sacrifice. He paid for our sins. That's what true love is. That's how much God loves us. Now listen to me. 
People walk around and they say, I don't know if there's a God. I'm not sure. And then you got to, you know, what about the guy over there in Africa? What about the guy in South America? What about the guy who never heard the gospel? God's going to judge him one day with hellfire and all this stuff? That's not a loving God. Well, listen, if you read your Bible correctly, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says God's not far from anybody. All right? He's not far from anybody. Read Acts chapter 17, Paul says, and We live, we move, we have our being. You know what? He's right there. We breathe because of him. Everything we get comes from him. And God says he put it in every human to know that he's there, that he's powerful, that he doesn't like sin, sins, and he's the creator. Everybody knows that. Because God said he put it in them to know. So listen, when you read your Bible about the gospel message, the, the gospel isn't the... The, the beginning of God's love, it's the extent of God's love. Literally, the Bible presents it as the human race, the, those that don't acknowledge God, walk around all day purposely not wanting to acknowledge God. Purposely not wanting to see if he's really there. Not want to know him. And the human race walks around making every other God and every other image and every other thing just because they don't want to know him. That's what the Bible says. When Paul gets to Mars Hill, what happens? They got altars everywhere. They got to the wind god, to the, the wood god, to the fruit god. You know, to every god there was. Every god that man can conjure up and make in his own mind. And then they got one little altar, just in case we didn't cover something, to the unknown god. Paul said, you guys got it all messed up here. He's right around us. He's close. He's not far from us. He goes, you know what? That's the God I'm going to declare to you because you guys are missing him because you're not really looking for him. Because you know what the Bible says? There's none that seeks after God. There's none that does good. So no one's going to get and stand before God one day at the judgment and say, hey, I tried my whole life trying to find you. You got no right to judge me. No, you know that's not going to happen, right? You say, well, what about my aunt? What about my mother who lived a good life that just didn't want anything to do with Jesus? What about this one? What about that one? I'm going to tell you what God says. No one's going to stand there before God and going to be able to point the finger to say, hey, I wasn't sure. I didn't know. I didn't know you were there. I didn't know you loved me. I searched for you. <laughs> The gospel is the extent of God's love. The witnessing and the preaching of the gospel is the extent of God's love. Meaning that God has done everything he could possibly do. He created us. He put it in us to know that there's a God. To know that he's powerful. To know that he hates sin. Human beings run from that. And you know what God does? The Bible says God runs after them. And he runs after them. And every day the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Listen. And he convicts of judgment to come also. Every day through the whole world. And God said, you know what? And I'm still sending my son into the world for them. And, and I'm going to still use these crazy people that are called Christians, people of the way, to go and tell people about my love for them. That's love. Not that we love God, but he loved us sent his son for us. See, it does something to me, you know, when I get along with God and I can look out. Listen, as Christians, you can look out and you can look beyond his creation, as beautiful as it is, and you can say, wow, God, the person that made all this is thinking about me right now. See, that, that's kind of what David did. And he was a little shepherd boy, you know, on the backside of the desert, shepherding the sheep. Remember what he said? He goes, you know, I, he said, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He goes, when I look up and I consider the moon, the stars, the work of your fingertips, he goes, what is man? Who am I that you're mindful of me? See, that does something for me. See, we can stop as God's children, as God's people and say, hey, Lord, because of the work you've done in my life, I can sit and, and think on and, and ponder your love for me and I can't believe it. But that should cause us to love one another. Look what he says. He says, love is action, love sacrifices, verse 10. Verse 11, 
Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If God loved us this way, how can our love not overflow to others that way? No man had seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. He goes, no one has seen God. You haven't seen him with your physical eyes. We're going to see him one day face to face, though. No man has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God dwells in us. See, if we really love one another the way God says, then you can see God. When Christians, listen, Christianity is not, I got to stick up for my rights. I got to fight for what's right in my life. I gotta, that's not Christianity. Christianity says, hey, you know what? I'm going to lay down like a doormat and you get to walk on me. <laughs> I don't like that doesn't mean you're not supposed to talk to that brother or correct them in love and do all that, but that might happen again. And then it might happen again. And this is, listen, those of you who have, that have been married for any, any length of time know exactly what I'm talking about here. Because what is marriage? It's continual. You know what? You know what? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. And then you love one another. And then you get into it again. I know no one fights with their wives here. And then you get into it again. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then you love one another. But that's how we're supposed to love one another in the body of Christ. You know, I don't want to be around those people anymore. I want to divide from those people. I don't like those people. Those people drag me down. Well, the Bible says if we love one another the way God loves us, then you can see God in us. Jesus said, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. So we should pray, God, make us the church that loves more than any other church. That's what we should be praying for. I believe this with all my heart. God will use the church that's 70% right doctrinally, but is filled 90% with the love of God, than the church that's 99% right doctrinally, but is dead right because they got no love. That was actually the church at Sardis, by the way. That's homework. You can look that up after. That's in Revelation. All right. No man had seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and, in, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him. Because he first loved us. Now listen, see what he says? He that fears is not made perfect in love. We need to think about our walks with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to think about this. I think about this. I read these verses. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. I believe God wants us, and, and I believe God, John is saying this practically. I believe John experienced this kind of love with the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe, you remember the Apostle John? He's the one that leaned on his bosom, the Last Supper. He's the one, he was the one, James and John, the sons of thunder, that wanted to wipe people out in the name of righteousness. Jesus said, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. The Son of Man came into the world to, to, to he came into the world to save men's lives, not to destroy them. They missed it. They didn't get it. But I believe that as John got older and he understood the love of Jesus Christ and the perseverance of Jesus Christ and the patience, listen, and the mercy of Jesus Christ, I, be I believe he fell in love with Jesus Christ and perfect love casts out all fear. Now, what does that mean? We're fearful about a lot of things sometimes, even as his kids, as his children. We're afraid we're afraid, Lord, but if I, do what you, if I do what your word says, I might lose out on this. I'm afraid you're going to come through for me here. 
Lord, if I do what your word says and if I cut this particular sin out of my life, Lord, I, I don't know if I can handle that. You know what? There's a relationship that I got to have. You know, I know it's sinful, Lord, but I know you love me anyway, but I can't because I'm afraid what's going to happen. I can't handle it if I cut this person off. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, Lord. Well, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear because fear has torment. That means the more you fall in love with Jesus Christ, the more you realize that God is your Father. He only wants what's best for you. He's never going to do anything to hurt you. The plans that he has for you are, are to prosper you, to give, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God has for me. That's what God has for you. But sometimes we get so fearful. Am I really in the faith? Am I not in the faith? Oh, do I really believe? Do I not? Oh, I've done this again and I've sinned and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I can't give this up in my life because I'm afraid what's going to happen. I won't be able to stand financially or emotionally in this relationship. What am I going to do? I'm afraid. I'm scared. Perfect love casts out all fear. But you know how much, you know how God, how much God loves you? God's Holy Spirit, what He does in your life and in my life, is all those things that we're afraid of, he loves us so much that those are the things that the Holy Spirit pinpoints in our lives because he wants us to know that he's going to come through for us. He wants us to know how much he loves us. I, you think about the things in your life. We all have these testimonies. God, I, I was afraid of this and I was scared. I was, I was afraid to take that job. Some of us, I was afraid to come out of my house, whatever it is. And those are the things that God works on in our lives. However he does it, I don't know. By his providence and sovereignty, absolutely. Because God wants us to realize that he's our deliverer. That he's our savior. That his plans are only good for us. And it's awesome when you go through something, when you're battling something, and you're scared and you're afraid. You know what? God's perfect love casts out all that fear. Because God never gives up on you. Listen, I preach this stuff, and you know what? Things come to my mind. Things come to my mind like, all right, well, you're preaching this stuff. What about the things you fear, Pastor Matt, in your mind right now? And I'm like, God, God, not those. Don't, don't do anything like that in my life right now. I'm not ready. Do it for everybody else, but not for me. But God wants us to realize how much he loves us. And the Holy Spirit never gives up on those things. You know, sometimes you go to pray, you want to pray about something else, some circumstance that's going on, but the Holy Spirit will pinpoint on, hey, you got this fear going on, you got this difficulty, you're not obeying the word because you're afraid, you're afraid of loss, you're afraid of whatever. You're going to, oh, oh, Lord, I don't want to deal with that right now. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. We only love him, verse 19, because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. John has already said this a couple times. If a man say, I love God, he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, very simple illustration, how can he love God whom he has not seen? He says, don't say you love God if you can't love the, the people who say they love Jesus, no matter what they've done to you. Or you think they've done to you. That's usually what it is, you know. He says, don't say you love God that you can't see with your eyes if you can't love the people that are right around you. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. Now listen. It's... <laughs> Love covers a multitude of sins. You know, when I was, sometimes I've, I, I've, I've gone through things in my Christian walk and in ministry, and you know, one verse has done a really, a, a, a lot of things in my life. I didn't plan on saying this, but this, this is just on my heart. I want to share this with you. You know, the Bible says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. You know what that means? That means when we get in the spirit of, hey, you know what? I'm going to battle it out with this person. I'm going to prove to them that they're wrong. I'm going to fight it out with this Christian brother and sister, whether it's on email, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on the phone, wherever it is. I'm going to fight it out with them. I'm going to prove to them that they're wrong. 
if there's anger in our hearts, that the wrath of man cannot work the righteousness of God. But you know what does work the righteousness of God? Love. Bearing long with the person. Going the extra mile. Giving of yourself. And even when you, people want to push that love away, you still keep loving that way. That's what changes things. That's, what, that's when God works. Listen, simple illustration. How are we going to reach people for Jesus Christ? It's not by battling it out with them, by fighting, fighting it out with them. By our wrath. Can't stand what's going on in this country. Oh, man, I'm going to fight it. I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna convert. We're going to reclaim America for Jesus Christ by uh, you know, getting involved in the political realm and everything else. And, uh, yeah, cast your vote, and you should. People died for that. But that's not going to do much. I just want to let you know. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Listen. You heard me say this illustration before, and it's a true one. I heard this story, I heard on the radio from a radio preacher years ago, I never forgot it. There was a soldier, I forget it was if it was in the Marines or the Army, I'm not sure, but you'll get the point. And every day, every night before he, he was done with his you know, duties and everything else, and he was turning down his bed and all that stuff, he'd get down on his knees to say his prayers. And what do you think those in the barracks did? that didn't believe in Jesus and getting on your knees to pray. They mocked him, they made fun of him, and all this stuff. Okay? This happened night after night. And he just, mind his business, said his prayers, went to bed. Well, one time they went a little over the line. And one of the soldiers in the barracks took one of um, his boots. If you ever held like an army boot, it's heavy. Took that boot as he was praying and chucked it off him. Hit him on the shoulder. Started to muffle. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not as godly as this guy was. I would have picked that boot up and threw it back at him at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what he did. This is a true story. He, you know, he gave out a little, like a little sigh because he was, you know, it hurt. Just kept praying, minded his business. Took the other boot, chucked it off him, hit him right off the head. You know, the laughs went through the barracks, everything else. Guy goes to sleep that night, you know, in pain, obviously. Everyone else went to sleep. This guy's nuts. This guy's crazy. Stop praying, all this garbage. The next day, the soldier that threw the boots woke up. And you know the two boots that he threw, his boots, were put back by his bed, shined, polished, right where they were supposed to be. And don't you know that's what broke down that, that individual? Because love covers a multitude of sins. That's what changes things for Jesus Christ. You know what? When people come and, and, and they've given you the gospel and they've told you the gospel and they've went to the extent to, to preach Jesus to you and tell you about Jesus in the midst of the hardship in their lives, you know what? That's love that covers a multitude of sins. One more illustration. Well, that guy ended up getting saved, by the way, with the, through the boots if I didn't tell you that. One more illustration, another true story. Girl's going to church, he gets saved. Starts going to church for a while. The pastor gets to know her a little bit. After a few months of going to church and this and that, you know, the newness and the joy of Jesus started to wear off in her life. And the pastor went to her and asked her, and he goes, what's going on? Is everything okay? You don't seem to have the joy of Jesus anymore. What's going on? She goes, pastor, it's just my father. He hates me. I, I remind them so much of, of, of my mother who he, you know, he divorced and she's dead now and he blames every, everything in his life that's happened on her. He's just a mean man. What can I do, please, to just deal with this guy? Can you help me? You know what the pastor said? This is a true story. He said, well, what is he like? And the girl's like, what do you mean, what is he like? He's like, well, what is he like? She's like, well, he likes... Fudge. He likes fudge. He, the pastor said, okay, I want you, the next time he's mean to you, I want you to make him some fudge. And she goes, what? Because she, you know, she's looking for the pastor to say, hey, you know what? Hit him with this scripture. Hit him with that scripture. Hit him with this. Hit him with that. 
but she did what the pastor said. Listen, she comes home one day, the same thing, you know, the grunts when she walks by, get away from me, all this stuff and everything else that was going on. You know, she made him the fudge. She brought the fudge out to him. Don't you know it broke him down? Don't you know he started to cry? Don't you know he said, hey, I'm sorry, can you ever forgive me? And don't you know that's what led him to Jesus Christ? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Now listen, we can, sometimes we can't even love one another that way. We're, we're not only called to love one another that way, we're called to love the lost that way. That's even harder. Now listen, didn't Jesus say this on the Sermon on the Mount? We can't even love one another that way. We're called to love people out there that way. The people that cut me off and are going too slow in traffic, hurry up, I'm telling them. It makes me crazy. Seriously. But that's how, we're called, that's how we're called to love them. But Jesus said this. If you love those who are like you, what reward do you have you in that? Even the Gentiles can love people that are like them. He goes, but what? You're supposed to, you're supposed to love greater than that. You're supposed to love those who persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for his name's sake. Because he said, rejoice, listen, be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. That's how we're supposed to love. That's what John's saying here in 1 John. That's how we're supposed to love one another. That's what's going to make a difference. Let's be the people. Let's be the church. Let's be the individuals that love more than anything else.